have the opportunity to introduce your, your speaker. I've known her and worked with her for about two years here at UAT. Uh, she teaches in the online uh, division, multiple classes. She comes to us with a degree, undergraduate, graduate, and PhD in business. She's worked in multiple industries from pharmaceuticals to uh, agricultural and uh, fertilizers, <laughs> I think, maybe. Yeah, actually, yeah. Was in there somewhere, <laughs> as well as uh, computer software sales, real estate, corporate training. She writes, and uh, she loves to teach. How many schools do you teach for? Uh, seven. Okay, she teaches for seven <laughs> schools right now. Uh, a marvelous lady. Uh, her students call her Dr. Diane. That's how we... Uh, <laughs> we uh, refer to her as uh, not getting too formal. She's written three books, maybe four, an online student's user's manual, uh, The Young Adult's Guide to Understanding Personalities, uh, Skills to Survive and Thrive in the Modern Workplace, which we all could use, and How to Re Reinvent Your Career, <laughs> to name four, I guess. No, the, actually there's three. The first, the second one was uh, a combination of two okay, titles, two parts, but sorry about it's that. been changed since then, uh, so you'll see it in a minute. It though. is my <laughs> great pleasure to introduce to you uh, for this last session, Dr. Diane Hamilton. Thank you. Well, welcome. It's nice to see everybody. I'm uh, happy to be here. Uh, there I am. Can't miss me. And I think uh, the, one of the reasons that they've uh, asked me to be here is because I teach here, and uh, that, that put me high on the list right off the bat. And I actually teach ethics and foresight. Have any of you guys taken any of my classes, anyone in here? Mostly online uh, students uh, are familiar with my courses, but um, what I teach has some aspects of business related to, to everything I do. And I know a lot of my students will get in class and they'll say, do we have to learn something that's not about software? I only want to talk about technology. I only want to talk about software. I only want this focus. And I understand that. I mean, your passion is technology. And we will talk about technology today, eventually. But you guys have to get a job. And part of getting a job is understanding that there's more to it than just knowing your, your passion, which is technology. There's uh, the skills that you need to market your, your abilities and to, to get recognized. If you really want to make a lot of money out there, you, you've got a lot of competition. You, you have uh, a market where there's a lot of people out of work, and you have to get yourself noticed. And you have a great advantage that you are tech savvy, that you can take advantage of the social networking and some of the other uh, software programs out there that'll help get you recognized. So we, we will get to the technology part, but I want to talk to you a little bit about my experience. You mentioned my books, so I put them up here. But um, the reason I put them up here is because I'm going to talk a little bit from each one of these. The online student's user manual has a lot of online information, which my students, of course, could use. But what it can do for you, and what I'm bringing from that into this lecture is the, the goal planning and a lot of the time management and things to get you to your goal of getting a job. So we're going to take some from my book on that. Uh, how to reinvent your career, obviously we're talking about getting a job and a lot of that is self-marketing and seeing yourself as a product. And that's what we're talking about today is marketing you. And, and the, the marketing is uh, in sales. I mean, you got to think of selling your your abilities and your skills and to, to showcase what you can do to people and, and that's what, what I'm going to take from that book. And then the last book uh, has a lot of what, what I'd love to talk about is personality skills and understanding personality assessments. Um, we, my daughter and I actually wrote that book together which is a lot of fun because it's meant for this age group and it's talking about explaining all the different personality assessments and how to use them to get along and work. And what we're going to use from that today is Later, you can use some of these skills to get along with your coworkers, but you're going to use some of these skills to do a better job getting the uh, interview and in the interview itself. So this is kind of a busy slide, but this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to go through these 10 steps, and a lot of it is an outline of your plan. You have to have a plan. If you have a goal, if you just say it, it doesn't do you any good unless you have a steps to get there. And so we're going to go through these 10 steps one by one and, and kind of explain what you guys should be working on to, to get your job and make the money you should be making. 
So the first step in my top 10 not so letterman list is uh, to define your goals. And goal setting is something I teach a lot of. Uh, in, I teach everything from bachelor level to doctoral level students and goal setting is in a lot of my courses. And the thing is, we, say you have a goal, if, if you don't make it measurable, you're never going to attain your goal. So how many of you guys even actually write down your goals? Does anybody? A few of you? Well, good, because um, not only do you need to write down the goal, but you have to write, write down the steps to get to that goal. One of the courses I teach here is a foresight course. And what we do in that course is we start with the end of the world. It's kind of exciting, you know, big bangs. At, you're thinking the beginning, you know, it's going to start that way. No, it, it starts with the end. And you kind of work backwards from the end of the world to look at global issues to corporate issues to business, you know, your corporate and business issues to your own personal issues. And when we get to the personal part, we talk about our own personal goals. But if you can't start at the end of what your goal is and work backwards, you're never going to reach that goal because you have to work on the steps to get there. So if you, say your goal is you want to graduate. Now that's very vague. You don't really ha know when. You don't know what you have to do to get there. Um, I have a lot of students that, that give me their goals and they're, they're very vague like that. And you have to make your goals, uh, you're going to take X number of courses per semester. You're going to graduate in X number of years. You're going to study for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for these hours. And, and you have to make them very specific because everybody likes to quote Yogi Berra, this, his famous line, if you don't know where you're going, you'll wind up somewhere else. And, and it's true. You have to be very specific. And then once you have your goal, you have to think of yourself as the product. And I know a lot of you guys probably aren't big sales people, and I spent my whole life in sales. I was, they used to make fun of me and call me the marketing queen because I love to do all the marketing stuff. And, and uh, I, so I teach a lot of marketing classes, and, and I, I teach for seven universities, and some, a lot of the classes I'm teaching are management and marketing related. But if you think about creating a marketing plan and how businesses create marketing plans, they look at the product price promotion and distribution. You have to think of yourself as the product when you're going out for a job because I have been on the other end. I've been the interviewer. I'm the one that looks at your resume. I've done all that in my jobs. And I'm looking at you as a product. What do you bring to the table? What is unique about you compared to the 10 other guys I'm looking at or 10 other gals I'm looking at right before you walk in the door? So you're the product. You have to see yourself that way. You have to price yourself just like you would a product. A marketing person would decide on a price. What's your salary? How many of you have gone to salary.com or any place to see what the salaries are for the jobs you want? You have to know what the prices are. You need to talk to people, find out what people are making, find out how to price yourself. If you're going for an interview for a job that pays something you're not even willing to take, why are you bothering? Why are you wasting your time? You need to be very specific on what price you're willing to accept for your skills. Promotion is a lot of what the technology, you guys are going to get into technology a little bit, um, that we'll talk about is how to, to showcase your, your talents. With, and we're going, to use, we're going to look at some of the uh, social networking and different type of ways to do that. And distribution, in this case, if you're the product, that's are you willing to move? Are you willing to travel? Are you interviewing for a job that has things like that involved with it and you're wasting your time? So you have to really kind of analyze yourself and analyze you as the product. Have anybody in here, have anybody taken a uh, business class where you've learned about SWAT? Yeah, it's, it's hard not to take a business class where they, talk, where they don't talk about SWAT. SWAT's huge in the business world. SWAT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But you can do a personal SWAT. And I recommend it. And actually, I have a marketing class I teach where I have the students do that. This will really help you develop your resume, for one thing. If you write down your strengths, I would do four columns. Write down strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And your strengths, are, those are going to be some of the bulleted points you're going to pull out later for your resume. I don't know how many re resumes you guys look at, but you really want to get bulleted points. You want to show your accomplishments. You don't want to show your tasks that you know how to do. You really want to show people what you bring to the table, what makes you de different than everybody else. So your strengths are going to be very important. You want to capitalize on those. Your weaknesses, those are things, okay, your strengths might have been I'm great at, at uh, Photoshop or I'm a, very artistic or what, whatever your strengths were, but your weaknesses might be I need to take Photoshop or I need to take some communication, uh, get, build my communication skills. So you need to look at those things and think, well, what can I do? Can I take a class to improve this? Can I do an online tutorial to improve this? You need to develop your strengths in the areas where you find a weakness. Opportunities. Uh, maybe you're 
your uh, uncle knows Bill Gates, that would be an opportunity. Um, but maybe, you know, they're opening a Google plant, uh, office down the street. I mean, you have to look at what opportunities exist that you hadn't thought of before. Take a look and, and see what's available. And then your threats right now, the economy is a big threat. You've got a huge amount of competition out there. That's a big threat. So the p most important thing is that you write down the solutions, not just the problems. And if you write down some solutions, when you get, do get to the interviewing process, you're, you're going to have answers if people ask you questions and, and you don't, won't be caught off guard. So it, whenever your uh, product, whatever, you're going to have competition. And I don't know how. Oh, hey. En Chisit, evaluamos el sabor de... Realize how important it is to know uh, what it is that they have that you don't have. So if you're in an interview and they ask you something and the guy before you has already answered the question perfectly, you have to know what, what the companies are looking for and what other people have that you need to work on. So you need to analyze who else is it go going for the same jobs that you're going for and see how you can compete with them. And then you need to change the things that you don't think you're strong in those areas. You need to work on that. Um, this is probably a big area for me, just as I mentioned, I wrote the book on personality assessment, and uh, I'm a certified um, em emotional intelligence instructor as well as a qualified Myers-Briggs instructor. So has, have any of you taken Myers-Briggs? Okay. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Myers-Briggs because um, a, a couple of different uh, personality tests because it's important to know your personality type, to know the job that you're best suited to do. Uh, I think a lot of you probably have a good idea because you're in a very specific school. Just to comment, everyone here has taken DISC. Oh, that's right. You guys do DISC yeah. here. And actually in my book I have a whole chapter on DISC. Yeah, so they're familiar with the DISC they're, side of it. Right. And actually in one of the classes I teach, I do the, the uh, RATH method too on the strengths finders. So that's also in my book. So if you guys take that class, I have a whole chapter on, on, on DISC and RATH. But we're going to go on a couple different ones. I'm not going to cover them here because you can spend all the whole our easily uh, speaking just about personality uh, tests. But I think that Myers-Briggs is a really important one to, to figure out your personality type, but there are a lot of different ones that are very helpful. And you can use a lot of this information on whether you're introvert, expert, and all the things that you find out with some of these personality tests to just nail the interview because you know how to deliver the information in the way they want it delivered. Because it used to be do unto others as, they, as you'd want done unto you, but it's not like that. It really is more do unto others as they'd want to be done unto. Because people like to get information the way they, they prefer it, and they don't want to get it the way you prefer it. And that's why it's important to learn it to get the interview, but it's also important to get along later in your job with people because everything's teams anymore. And if you're on a team and you don't understand other people's personalities, you're going to have issues. And I, I used to work... Uh, where I'd go to organizations and teach teams uh, based on their Myers-Briggs results how to get along with one another. And after they took the test, we, we would go over some of these things. And I won't go into all of this, but if anybody that has seen Myers-Briggs, they, they assign you to either be an extrovert or introvert in all the different categories. You're either a sensor or an intuitive, a thinker or a feeler, a judger or a perceiver. So the more important thing I think for you guys to get out of Myers-Briggs and we can talk about just here is the extrovert versus introvert. And in the regular world you see more extroverts, but I think being an online uh, professor I see more introverts. And definitely in my classes being online and technology oriented I get a lot of introverts. Have any of you taken this test and know if you're, who knows here if they're an introvert? You know, you're the only one that knows for sure if you're an introvert. An introvert I think you'll know more if I give you a little bit of an explanation. Introverts prefer to, to think about what they want to say before they say it. They, they don't just immediately blab what, what they're thinking. They, they, they like to process what they think about, and that's why I get a lot of students online that really like it because they have time to process their information, and they don't get called on from a professor and say, okay, what's the answer? And they put the, you know, right in your face. They're, an introvert really likes to have a little bit more time on their, um, in their thinking process. The extrovert, which I would be, is someone that never stops talking. And they, they process uh, what they're saying as they're speaking. They don't think at first. So um, their thinking is simultaneous, simultaneous to what they're saying. So an extrovert's more likely to go, oh, I wish I hadn't said that where the introvert's going, huh, 
I wish I'd said that. So now that you know the differences between the two, how many are you m more likely to say, I wish I hadn't said that? Raise your hand. And how many of you are more likely to say, I like the enthusiasm there. Um, how many are you, uh, of you are more likely to say, I wish I had said that? See, we got a lot of introverts here. And, and that's an important thing to know when you're going for a job interview because I'm the type of person you might be interviewing with. And I am hyper extrovert. And you, you just don't know who you're gonna be interviewing with till you get there. And you're gonna have to learn to read people. And if you are an, an extrovert, I'm sorry, an introvert, and you're interviewing with me, you need to know that I'm gonna just berate you with questions and you're gonna be wanting to think and not be able to process things because I'm talking and talking and talking and you're not having a time to, to come up with your ideas. So there's a really good trick that you guys need to think if you're an introvert and you're finding that you're interviewing with somebody like me, that, see, what I'm thinking is, you didn't hear me, you don't know the answer, I'm gonna answer your questions for you because you're too slow. I think there's something wrong maybe with you because you didn't answer because I don't know that, you know, most people don't know the difference between introverts and extroverts. So what you need to do is when an extrovert asks you a question, you need to say, that's a really good question. Give me a minute, let me think about that. What that does is it makes the interviewer realize you heard them. So they won't answer the question for you, which they'll be tempted to do. They, they still don't like dead air. So it's gonna kill them that you're not answering. But they'll at least know that, that you're, you're processing. And I think it's a very important tactic if you're an introvert. Now for the few extroverts in here, if it's the other way around, you're gonna wanna talk all over the introvert and not gonna let them ask you any questions and you're gonna annoy them to death. So you need to learn to realize if you're talking to somebody that seems like they're more pensive and they're thinking and they're not blabbing like us extroverts, that you need to give them a little bit of time and learn when to stop talking and be quiet. See, it's hard for me to even do it because I'm an extrovert. Okay, another personality preference type, just so you know, I, I think you might find this interesting because you were talking about DISC and there was another personality assessment I had to take for a company that uh, I worked for that they made us actually take the test to find out if we were a red, a blue, a yellow, or a green. And I had to keep this on my wall, on my cubby of my, uh, my cubicle. And people would know what you were and they knew how to interact with you based on what color you were. And what I think is interesting about this is it kind of, these tests, uh, there's management by strengths and a lot of different ones that are color related. And, and I talk about that in some of my writing. but you can kind of see what a person's like when you're interviewing to know how to, which category they fall into just by what th things they do. The red person is the, the really direct person that's in your face and just very bold and, and, and comes at you really hard. That's a red direct. And they like you to be that way back. They want you to get to the point. They don't want you to just, oh, well, I did, you know, and be all cozy and nice. And they, 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 they like you to, to reach them on their level. So you have to do a little bit of interpreting when you're in an interview to see what people are like. The blue person is the real calm person that's kind of laid back and doesn't want you to get right in their face. So if you try the red tactic with the blue, you're gonna turn them off. And you're going, well, how am I gonna know what they are when I'm sitting there in five seconds? And you gotta kind of lay back for a few minutes and kind of see how they do things. And, and, and you'll, it'll pretty be pretty obvious how someone is. You, you just try to think what their personality type is coming across as, and then you try to, to be kind of that way with them, and it, it'll make them more comfortable. The yellow type are the engineers, the doctors, the guys that read the manual from front to back. If you see a guy that's got a lot of statistics on their desk, they have, they just, they're talking about bottom lines and numbers, and then that's what they want to hear from you. What can you bring to the table statistically? They, they're very quantitative. You need to talk to them that way. And then the green is, yeah, I'm a green, they're the talky ones, they want to talk, talk, talk with you. And you need to, t to try and, and I realize some of this doesn't come naturally to a lot of introverts and to, to different you know, people, but it, it's gonna help you in the interview process if you realize that you need to kind of get a little bit out of your comfort zone sometimes to meet people on their level. And we talked a little bit about emotional intelligence and I, I wrote my dissertation on uh, emotional intelligence and its impact on performance because I, I find emotional intelligence really interesting. Has anybody read Daniel Goleman's book? Um, he's the one that made emotional intelligence kind of a buzzword about 15 years ago. 
He's, he writes about how it's become more important to have a high EQ, which is your emotional quotient, than your IQ almost. And that employers are really looking to make sure you have skills, you're, you have interpersonal skills. In, in, like what we talked about, when you're in the interview, you're able to talk and, and understand and have empathy for how the person you're, you're socializing or talking to feels. And, and so it's all about my definition I like to use is kind of a combination of all the definitions, but it's understanding your own feelings as well as those in others, uh, your own emotions as well as those in others. So that includes having empathy and interpersonal and, and in, intrapersonal and stress tolerance. And all these things are all part of having an emotional intelligence. And as the picture suggests, emotional intelligence is the big part of the picture because if you don't have that, you're not going to be a team player and you're not going to get along well with people. Now, the difference between emotional intelligence and like a Myers-Briggs or a DISC or some of those profiles, some of those personality profiles, you're kind of born with your preferences. You kind of stick with your preferences as kind of who you are. But emotional intelligence, you can develop. This is something that you can get better at. And you can become more empathetic and you can have better interpersonal skills. And uh, I think it's really important. I'm going to give you some suggested reading at the end for a couple of people that write about this. So um, we'll touch on that. But um, I just put this in. So this is a new study that just came out in the Journal of Psychological Type where they took a look at who, who's satisfied with their jobs. I thought this was interesting. Because remember we talked about extroverted and thinking and the different types of Myers-Briggs personalities. Well, the thinking types are the types that like facts and figures, and I'm one of those. And the extroverts are, we already discussed. So they're saying these two types from the Myers-Briggs personality type did, did well on their emotional intelligence tests. So um, they, 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 they kind of did better than the introverted and the feeling types. But they're saying that it's more important that you have emotional intelligence to be a, uh, happy and successful in your job and have job satisfaction. So you can develop your emotional intelligence, which is the main point of this. So what I said before, talk, look for Dr. Dan Daniel Goldman has some great uh, books out there about en Chisi, te evaluamos el sab and its importance. Uh, Marsha Hughes has some books about how to develop your uh, uh, your, your emotional intelligence as well. And I have a lot on my blog. If you guys are interested in any personality information or any of the stuff I talk about, I write a lot of articles on all these topics on my blog, and that's my blog address. So it's just drdianehamilton.wordpress.com. And I do a little segment on there you might be interested in called Ask Dr. Diane. And if you have a question, you can email me, and I'll be happy to answer it on my blog. I won't put your name if you don't want. I just say this is the question, and if you think other people could benefit from it, I'll put it on there. So now, now we know we're the product. We know how to deal with people. But we, how are we going to distribute? How are people going to find out about us? We have to analyze our distribution channels. And a lot of people know about Monster and all the career sites, career builders, or whatever sites you guys use. But a lot of people are not taking advantage of some of the other important sites, such as YouTube, Google Docs, WordPress, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and the list goes on and on. But these are some of the ones that I'm going to talk about today because I think you guys have such an advantage, especially with like YouTube, because you guys are so creative that you can really showcase your talents with having a flip camera or just nothing. You don't need high technology to even to do that much. You can import a, a PowerPoint presentation with Camtasia or, or uh, even Google Docs or any of these programs. You can, if you, if you showcase your talents here, and get known, you know, you never know if it'll go viral and you don't know who's going to see it. And the more people that you send it to and you ask them to send it to more people, the more chance you get exposure and people go, wow, this person can really do this kind of thing. So you can, it's easy to, how many of you guys have a YouTube channel? A few of you? Yeah. So you know how easy it is. You just sign up, it's free, and you just upload. But if you do create a video, make sure you have a website or some other uh, contact information at the end of your video so that they know how to reach you and they know you want to develop your your brand for you. You're the brand. You're the product. So you need to do that. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Okay. That's one you need to get on if you're not on. And it's not just for us old people. LinkedIn is cool. It's got a lot of good things because um, you can import a lot of things into LinkedIn. You can export a lot of things. Uh, you can become an expert. You can... For, uh, if you look... Um, at the Q&A area in LinkedIn. That's a great area to start to, to become an expert. People are asking questions all the time. And if you're trying to showcase your talents that I'm really good at Photoshop, I'm really good at whatever program, you can go to the area where people are going, how do I do this? You answer the question. That's all you have to do. And see the top influencers this week in the middle? 
they, they, they start showing people's names of who, who answers things the best and who's a success in, in these rooms. And you're, you'd be amazed by how, how many people you get to know. I, I meet a lot of people through the groups area. I'm sure there's a lot of groups you guys could join that you get in and you might just ask the most innocent of questions. I know in a writing group I was in, I asked a question of, about press releases, just something I wasn't even trying to promote myself. I seriously had a question. I, I've met my publicist, I met all, I mean, I met so many people just from asking a simple question. People will get to know you, they'll say, hey, you need to talk to this person or you need to talk to that person. Don't just get on LinkedIn and just sign up with a couple people. You gotta keep developing and adding and asking people to introduce you to other people. If you just sign up and don't do anything, it's like being on Facebook with one friend. What good does it really, you know, I mean, you're, no one's gonna look at your stuff or no one's gonna care. So browse the career categories. I put them down here in the bottom just to show you that there's a lot of help on LinkedIn that'll help you with career information. And I think they're very, very important. And I mentioned Google Docs. That's another thing that you can do with LinkedIn is you can incorporate Google Docs into your LinkedIn main page. So it's, uh, mine shows a few presentations there, but when you first sign up, it won't have anything. And it's, it's just, if you can do a PowerPoint presentation, it, it's very similar. You can showcase your talents, and then when people are friends with you on LinkedIn, they can see it on your main page. And even if you aren't on, using it for LinkedIn, you can have it so everybody else can see it. They have um, sharing different choices, so the world can see your Google Docs presentation if you want it to. Um, th speaking of Google, you want to clean up uh, your reputation because people are going to Google you. And if uh, you haven't Googled yourself to know what they're going to see, you need to do that. And you need to get rid of anything that's out there. And I totally recommend getting rid of any Facebook pictures of uh, anything that puts you in a compromising position. Whether you think it's safe or not, people can right click, save as, your picture is somebody else's and it can get out there. I recommend now, I mean, it's fun when you're young to have the stupid pictures, but once you, once you get out, you, you really need to have it, burn, it's not gonna burn you out there. And so you, you Google yourself, find out what's being said, positive and negative, see what's out there. It's, it's gonna make, could make the difference on your job if you don't think they're checking it. They're checking that, they're checking your credit report, they're checking everything on you guys. Check your credit report, make sure, go to myfico.com or any of the free credit places that you can see what they're seeing, because that's a big factor for people. They wanna see, that you are responsible, and your credit's a big, fact, big way for them to find out. Um, I also think it's good if you want to get a blog. I like, this is my, my blog. Um, I, I think you can add a lot of your sites where people can follow you, if you're on Twitter, if you're on Posterous, or any of the ones like I've listed here. I think you can showcase your information every day. This is, this is, look at this game I created, look at this, look at that. If you have it on YouTube, you could incorporate it on here, and it's in all different spots. And, and you can put your blog on um, LinkedIn. So you know, it, it, every time you update your blog, it, it carries over to LinkedIn. So I, I think it's a very important thing that you can do to showcase what, what you're able to do. And Facebook, which I'm sure most of you guys, everybody on Facebook, pretty much. Uh, Facebook, I have my personal page that I have with my kids, where I have my stupid stuff. And then I have my one that everybody else can see. And um, what I do is, for, if you, for my product, I have books, so I do a product page. You guys could do the same thing with your artwork or your web design or whatever. Create a page that you don't have to be friends with somebody for them to see that. If, and it's really an important way to showcase what you're able to do. And it gets your name out there. So I recommend that. And Twitter, of course, you can do, uh, do Twitter, you can link Twitter with uh, LinkedIn as well. And it's much more in status updates. I mean, I, I, when I first came out, I'm thinking, I don't really care that you're going to the grocery store or that you bought a new pair of shoes. But it's not like that anymore. Businesses are really using Twitter quite a bit. You need to, to get some important messages out. If you write a blog or if you have something on YouTube or something, you need to include links and make sure it's on Twitter. And so you get more like-minded and career-minded people following you. And uh, that's my dog, Lilu. And she's a dachshund. And that's my iGoogle page. And I use iGoogle quite a bit. I like it because it, you can use the Google Reader. You can, you can put your goals and your information on your calendar. It's just, if you, we're talking about getting organized and writing things down, if you don't have some kind of a page that you follow and keep everything together, I, I think it's really important. I also like the Google uh, News. 
if you see underneath the clock, couple ones down, I do use Google News to do search words for it, for the industry, whatever you're looking for. If you're looking for jobs, if you're looking for information, if you're trying to educate yourself in certain areas, you can set up. It's like a Google Alert kind of thing, but it's on your your i Google. I recommend doing that. It works really well. Okay, so now you need you know where you want to showcase it, but you need to to showcase it and so you need to get an attention getting resume and if um, you haven't if you guys are going to graduate soon and you haven't got your resume together you need to start working on it. you need to have a plan for when you're going to have your resume done when you're going to start sending it out when you're going to start looking on monster when you're going to start networking when you're going to get all get all these as part of your goals and, and write them down because you need to start utilizing these sites now because it takes a while to get noticed. You have to start building your presence. And you need to be persistent. You can get your word out through the old-fashioned way. Talk to everybody. I know you guys are introverts, and I know it's probably not comfortable for you sometimes, a lot of you that are introverts, I should say, to go to people and talk. But if you're in the grocery line or you're on the airplane or you're... Talk to people. Have a, a business card. I don't care if you have no job. You still need a business card. You need to have your name, your your email you need to have a way for them to contact you and you give it to everybody and you start conversations with everybody and you have I used I mean I'm a salesperson so I had every gimmick in the world but I'll tell you one that really worked and if if you can get over the oh my god factor and, and but I know a lot of people don't like the sales gimmicks but I would print out my business card and it would be in color because my card was in color and I stuck that sticker on a box of Altoids and if I met somebody that I thought was really important I gave them the box of Altoids. So every time they opened that box, they had to look at my stupid picture, you know? And it reminded them that, to that here, this person's really serious, you know? And, and, and it, gets, it sticks in their mind. Think of little gimmicks that you feel comfortable doing. You don't have to use that if that makes you uncomfortable. But think of ways that people are gonna remember you because if you don't think the competition's tough right now, it's, this, this economy is making you need to stand out. If you really wanna make the money and not just take the job that everybody else can get it as easily, you need to, to stand out in the crowd and that's one way to do it. So let me give you some resume tips. Like we talked before, bulleted points go back to your, your strengths from your SWAT. It'll help you get some of your bulleted points. Uh, put your most impressive uh, uh, accomplishments first. Do not put tasks. Don't say, I filed papers. I mean, that, nobody cares what your tasks were. They wanna know, what did you do? Did you increase productivity? Did you create something that no one else could create? Did you do something different? What, what, did you, what do you bring to the table? You need to make it very uh, specific. And also, make sure dis the description of your job, of whatever you did, captures attention, especially if you're going for a job that has a specific title. If your title was anything near that title, make it like that title so that people go, oh, they've done this before. You know, So think about that. And then, um, don't make it more than two pages. If you're writing a book, nobody cares. One to two pages max. If you can get it on one, great. But you want to have white space, so you don't want it cramped. And of course, spell check and print it on professional paper. Do not print it on regular copy paper. And make sure when you go to the interview that you have several copies. So many people go to interviews and they don't bring copies. And en Chisi, te evaluamos. It just makes you look very unprofessional if you don't. So very nice paper, several copies. And on your resume, make sure you have an industry buzzword. Whatever is in their ad, look at the ad that they're, they're, um, they've submitted for. And if, there's, if they want you to do a certain kind of programming, make sure that word is in there. Or whatever it is, make sure you use the buzzwords. And make sure you don't write in first person. Take out the I and what I did and what, you know, take out that not first person. So you got a great resume. You finally get the interview. You want to use the personality skills that we talked about before. But if you go to an interview and you haven't done research on that company, you're in, I, I, I've asked so many people when I'm interviewing them, why my company, why not my competitor? And if they give me the deer in the headlights look, that means they haven't done their research, they don't know why. And if you don't know the answer to that question, you're gonna flounder in the interview and people won't be interested in you. They want you to show interest in the company. They want you to know every, everything about them. And if you don't, you're, somebody else is going to. And maybe in a regular market, you can get away with more of that kind of stuff, but not in this market, you just can't. You can't. And ask questions, show interest, be, uh, be involved. And uh, we're gonna show you a couple interviewing mistakes you kinda wanna avoid. As I said, showing up unprepared if you don't have your resume copies. Uh, these are just com some of, from my book of things that we see commonly. Um, you pay too little attention to your par parents. I would like guys 
How many of you guys know in here where your tie is supposed to hit? Do you know how long your tie is supposed to be? This is like a huge pet peeve that I, I think a, a lot of interviewers know that men don't get this right. Get this right, guys. Middle of the belt. No. It's got to be middle of your belt. So if you're a guy that wears your pants up here, then it's here. Your tie goes here. <laughs> but if your pants are hanging off, you're not dressed right anyway. Okay, so you need to have your pants at a normal height. Your, t your tie goes middle of the belt, okay? So that's a very important thing. Women make a lot of mistakes with the shoes. This part of your shoe, women, look at the back of your shoe because we're looking at the back of your shoes right here. You want to have the cleanest, best looking. You don't want to look like you're not taken care of. Those are probably the two mistakes. I mean, the women make that mistake the most. That, too much jewelry, too much, you know, fl fluff or whatever. But with the men, get your tie right. That's it's really the only thing you guys have to get. I mean, it's pretty easy for you guys. We have a lot worse, okay? So just get the tie right. Okay, so don't talk too little too much. We talked about don't ever be negative. One of the things I always tried to get people to do to see if they were negative is to talk say something bad about somebody they worked with in the past. And you'll hear a question like, uh, tell me a time that you had a problem with a coworker or something to that effect. You've never had problems with coworkers. Everybody's wonderful. You love life, okay? To be positive. Do not, do not rag on anybody for any reason. Take, <laughs> take a negative thing, if you can even think of a negative thing, and make it just sound like, oh, it's the best thing in the world. You do not want to be negative. Don't fidget. Don't turn in a messy application. Uh, you know, don't sit down before they offer you a seat. Do typical etiquette. You just have to be on your game, have your cell phone off. A lot of these things are pretty obvious. But even if the guy that you're interviewing is using foul language, if he's interviewing you and he's just F-bombs all over the place, don't join in, whatever you do. That doesn't give you uh, the right to do it. And follow up on your interview when you're done. This is hugely important. If you're not sending a, a follow-up uh, letter and thanking them, either um, knowing, uh, I'm, I'm saying, I would say get their, get their business cards. Get, get some kind of contact information on your way out and be thinking of how you're going to thank them, but be thinking a couple jobs ahead in terms of is this job the right one for me or or do I have to take this job because I want two jobs down the road maybe I have to settle for a, a, a lesser job right now you have you have to think about that when you're in the follow-up stages because you you need to, to follow up with people for things that maybe are down the road that that aren't necessarily this particular job and it's important that as soon as you get out of your interview that you write down notes uh, everything that you guys talked about, his kid's name's this, or her, her daughter's name's that, they, they like golf, they like, it, it, just write down anything you notice, that they had a plaque that they went to Indiana someplace, or, you know, if you can find something that you can tie into later that shows you were attentive, and that you paid attention, and you were interested in them, add that in this thank you note, you can send an email or snail mail, uh, snail mail's kind of impressive if you do a nice job that you took the effort to write a handwritten note, but you know you do it nice and clearly. But I think it's important. And if you used anybody as a referral, you make sure you call them and give them a heads up so that they know they're going to need a call. So keep interviewing. Don't assume you got the job. It may take months to get a job. Uh, I when I was I was a pharmaceutical rep for 15 years, and it took me nine months, I know, because I had just found out I was pregnant. And I was in the hospital having my baby when they called me and told me the job actually opened up. And I didn't bother mentioning that I was pregnant all those months. And I kept talking to him on the phone, you know, and we, we, were, we would uh, discuss when this job's going to open up. And I thought, well, why tell him? I don't want to make him worried about it, you know. And it turns out it took nine months to get that job. So sometimes you have to settle for other jobs while you're waiting for the, the dream job. So keep interviewing. And then use what we've talked about here to succeed. And understand that by understanding personalities, it's going to not only get you the job, but it's going to make you be successful in your job. And if you can learn more about that, you're going to be much more successful. And use those goal-setting techniques that we talked about for on the job just to keep up. And I would continue with social networking. Stay connected. You don't know. This job may, go, may be gone tomorrow. You may need all those contacts. Keep, keep developing it. It can only lead to something good. To have The more people you know, the better. And always kind of do things for others, and not for the, because they'll owe you one, but because it'll eventually, it pays back in the end. It's a good thing to do. People appreciate it, and I, I really think it's very helpful. 
Now, we talked about some of the things that uh, I said I was going to tell you, some things you could do. To, you can read the, uh, what color is your parachute. Have anybody read that here? That's kind of like the, the, the main Bible for deciding what jobs fit your personality and your interests. So I, I think that's a pretty important book to read. Um, read articles on job sites that are specific to your industry and set up your RSS feeds like we talked about. And make sure you have measurable goals. And if you can't find a regular position, look into internships. Look at temporary placement agencies. There's a lot of other ways to get your foot in the door. I, I took a jo job, for, they had Kelly girls when I was young. And <laughs> I was a Kelly girl. And I just didn't really enjoy it that much, I have to say. The few times I did it, I, I mean, I just got in kind of boring jobs where they didn't have much for me to do. And I had one phone call that they, they said, it's just one day. And I thought, oh, do I want to do this? And I, oh, OK. And I took the job, and I stayed with that company 20 years. So don't, don't disregard temporary uh, positions, because they can lead to things. So if anybody wants to contact me, if you want to ask me, uh, ask Dr. Diane or any other question, my website's just drdianehamilton.com, and my blog is drdianehamilton.wordpress.com. Does anybody have any questions? I think you, uh, the, the question was, if, how much is too much information to put on your business card? The, the, I think that the typical business card is what you want. You want your name, your, your website, your, uh, your phone number, at least. You don't want it so busy that you, you, know, you list all your accomplishments and like a resume. You just want it so that it, somebody can find you later and they know your, your main, your, I think your email, your website, your phone number, and your name would be the at least minimum that you would need. Is there something you want to put on there that you're thinking about? Analysis. Curious what to put on? I would. I would put anything that showcases your, your abilities and that people can go check out anything about you. You want them to be able to reach you and see uh, what, you, what you have to offer. Good question. Anybody else have anything? Um, hi, what kind of questions should you ask during the interview to the interviewer? I think you could ask things about their future. I think they, that they like to um, know that you're interested in what, what their projections are, what products they have coming down the pipeline, wh wh what direction they're headed. They kind of like you're interviewing them, you know? I, I think it kind of puts you in a, like, well, uh, maybe I'll think about this, you know, because you're, you're seeing what do you have to offer. And I think it's kind of an important question that you should know anyway. Uh, um, I mean, I was in pharmaceutical sales for a long time, so everything was R&D and pipeline if, if a company was successful. So I guess it, a lot depends on the company. But I think you, questions that show that you're interested in where they're going and what they're doing, asking them if they have an international pres presence or anything you couldn't find, that if it's obvious on their website, don't ask it. But if it's something that you've got a question, huh, I, saw, I, I think any time it shows that you did research, I saw this on your website, how is it coming along, is always a good one. Are there any questions you shouldn't ask? You don't want to ask, uh, how's the lawsuit going? Um, you don't want to ask. <laughs> I'm sorry. You don't want to ask, how's the lawsuits going? Okay. You don't want to ask anything that's going to bring to light a real negative thing that they're trying to maybe not talk about. Uh, how's your product failure going? You know, things like that. Um, you don't want to ask. Uh, Actually, I, I just printed, if anybody goes to my blog, I just did a, an article about things that people asked in interviews that were just like, you know, it, it was um, about millennial people, that, that age group of the millennials, of things that they've actually asked in interviews that you shouldn't ask. Um, and one of them was like, can I use Facebook at work? And can I do my work at the gym? I mean, stuff like that. Don't ask that. <laughs> and um, how, you don't, you're not supposed to ask how much money, technically. That, that's something you get to later down, en Chisi, te evaluamos. down the road. Uh, you don't want to interview for something. If they'll, they'll pretty much tell you what the, the salary is if they think it might be an issue for you. Sometimes you might waste your time with an interview because they haven't told you the, the, how much it's going to pay. Sometimes you just 
don't find out till the end because but you don't want to ask in the first interview you just unless it's unless you're so sure you can have the job that it won't really matter but I, I don't I, you kind of stick away from financial stuff and you can find out a lot of things on salary.com or from people that have worked for that company or other things to kind of give you an idea of what a job pays and they'll eventually you know it'll they'll bring it up any other questions what kind of suggestions do you have for portfolios or putting together a portfolio? Well, I think you need to have a lot, like we talked about, your strengths and things sh showcased. I think it depends. You guys are so artistic and creative that anything you can showcase that you've done, if you've written a program, uh, if you've created a game. I know one of my students created an app that was so cool. I downloaded it on my iPad. I loved it. You know, anything you can showcase that you do. Uh, that they can get an idea of what you do, even if it's just print screens of something, you know, to, to just give an idea. There's a lot you can do with print screens. Just, say, you know, create a uh, Camtasia over a PowerPoint presentation to show, showcase what you can do. It's, it's very, or ping, what do you guys use here? A lot of ping, don't you? But, yeah, is, have you guys familiar with Camtasia? It's, it's pretty simple. You just use it over your PowerPoint presentation and take a print screen, make it into a JPEG of everything you can do and create that. You could also then, if you do it with Camtasia, import that into YouTube. Once it's in YouTube, you get the HTML code, copy it, paste it into your blog. I mean, it just all goes everywhere. There's, I don't know if you're familiar with it. There's a new one out, too, that's better, uh, better than PowerPoint. It's called Prezi. What, what is it called? Prezi, P R E Z I. Oh, I, yeah. Uh huh. I have heard of it. And, I haven't uh, used it, though. If y'all haven't seen Prezi.com, uh, go there. You can get an educational free mm -hmm. uh, license, and it sort of blows PowerPoint away because it's not static like PowerPoint is. And then you can take it to Camtasia. It's web based. Great. And you can. Uh, There's just so many programs out there. YouTube you it can or do. whatever. Right. Great. Thanks, Bill. Anybody else have any questions? Well, thank you very much. You guys were great, and I appreciate uh, Donna, being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and with that, that wraps oh, up welcome. this year's Tech Forum. There's one other workshop tomorrow if you're interested you in Chris Land's.